67% GPU usage at most for a native 1080p 60fps target on a desktop 3060. A traversal competent open world with dense and optimized foliage, interactive non-screen space global illumination, and dynamic light compatible shader illusions that provide nanite levels of detail for a fraction of nanite's cost, and without the under-discussed visual problems nanite promotes. Gamers and developers, hit that subscribe button before I get started on providing you with exclusive performance statistics that measure out the how and why this game is so performant, and what technical decisions provide the realism this game offers. Followed by a conclusion segment where I'll explain where our ninth generation target hardware can build upon the scenario to enhance where realistic presentation is lacking. The reason why I'll be doing such a deep technical analysis of Days Gone is because I want more people talking about it. Successful games like Red Dead Redemption 2 and Witcher 3 get plenty of spotlight in day-to-day -day conversations, media, and content creators because those games did very well in sales. That causes a perpetual culture that thrives but is meaningless in lessons that need to be learned. Days Gone didn't do nearly as well, which means it barely comes up in conversations, media and content creators don't feel like it's popular enough to draw in ad views or reference for media topics. Even the director pointed out Sony's neglect to showcase the IP they own. So enough is enough. We're producing this video to achieve that mentality shift the industry is needing right now. Now Days Gone uses Unreal Engine 4.11, but Ben Studios did a lot of modifications which I'll show in great detail to get this title looking as complete as it does. With the following settings I consider optimized, combined with a full system restart before opening the game, it uses at most 67% of our desktop 12GB3060 for a 1080p 60fps target, and a median millisecond budget is at most 8.9 milliseconds meaning we have about 7 milliseconds worth of budgeting to enhance what is most definitely lacking in this overall impressive presentation. That's not including where even greater performance potential could be obtained, which I'll explain as we analyze the frame. So here's the captured frame, and as you can see there's tons of foliage because that's the main thing I wanted to stress test in this video. Subsurface scattering is very nice to look at when you're in contrasting lighting environments. For the capture I wanted to include very little sky since it's usually pretty cheap to render. For instance, when I tilt the camera up to the sky, I gain about 4 milliseconds, so we have a good worst case scenario here. Now this frame is in motion, and the motion blur in this game is not very strong, but the TAA is a whole other story, and it's very poor in my opinion. Now, funny thing, the person who worked on this TAA was an ex-NVIDIA graphics programmer, and this TAA has a striking resemblance to the DLAA. This TAA goes less than DLAA. But when completely still, both resolve to what I would say in a uniquely clear, super sampled like image. But the moment any motion is introduced, walking, idle animations, or subtle camera swaying, you get a very specific image blur from both techniques. Geometric edges also share a similar appearance and behavior. It's possible that developers of DLAA slash DLSS reference an old colleague's TAA work for DLSS 2 and beyond. But moving on, let's start analyzing this game's graphics pipeline. Now the first thing that I notice in this pipeline is the small presence of dispatches in this area. I haven't seen such a clean frame startup since our Need for Speed analysis. But unlike Need for Speed, it begins a pre-pass which only renders the scene depth. This is done because depth is cheaper to render and allows the GPU to prevent wasting performance on more complicated slash expensive pixel shading that could appear behind closer geometry. I'm not a huge fan of pre-pass rendering because you still deal with single pixel overdraw in terms of pixel rejection, and it also goes against an optimization rule regarding resource context, which can end up doubling the cost of any inherent optimization issues. Take the foliage and landscape for example. Very few resources are taken for the landscape, but it acts as a major occluder. But look how much more GPU resources the foliage invokes on the GPU. What blew up this timing was mostly this context that the GPU processed, but that context was only used to get depth values. Now in the second geometry pass, your GPU has to spend the same amount of time processing the same context to write or process different information that it could have processed beforehand. This is a generalized hierarchy of rendering scenarios from the best to worst performance potential. Now, if it wasn't for what I'll show you happens after the pre-pass, I would have guessed this game was forward rendered. Because forward rendering, at least in UE5 to 5.3, can only handle a few shadow map casting lights. Forward and rail games have a heavy reliance on baked or screen space shadows, which only need that scene depth, which is very similar to Days Gone. That's why this particular area in the game looks very flat and dated. The over-reliance on screen space shadows feels more than odd, as if there's some kind of unique limitation for shadow maps other than the low cost they would normally have in a standard optimized deferred or forward plus rendering pipeline. Also, Epic Games added Ben Studio's screen space shadows in Unreal.14, which also introduced a new forward shading pipeline. But Days Gone's second geometry pass doesn't look anything like UE4.14's forward base pass, which doesn't support moving sun shadows, and it definitely doesn't resemble UE4.11's deferred pipeline. As you can see, the amount of render targets is way smaller, 
but the most shocking difference is the absence of the albedo render target. Now it could be compressed in a way where we can't perceive it. For instance, there's no world normal render target either, but you can modify the color histogram of these render targets and you'll be able to pick out some hints of some normal like information, but only for a few objects. We could end up with an update from Ben Studios after this video is released. If we do, you'll be able to find those in our pinned comments, which also correct video errors and commonly asked questions. In a couple moments, I'll show a later stage in the pipeline that code some of these render targets into more traditional G-buffer representations. Now we're not done discussing the second geometry pass. This render target contains depth information relating to geometric micro detail, allowing screen space effects such as SSAO or screen space shadows to fake incredible amounts of detail for a relatively cheap price. Actually, according to the lead rendering programmer Graham Aldridge, this depth illusion is said to have no noticeable performance impact. Because it's texture and MitBat based, it provides very stable imagery at grazing angles. With TAA removed, the only major instabilities you'll see here are from screen space effects like shadows or AO that are expecting TAA smoothing, but the ground material itself is still pretty stable without any help. Modern graphic trends would have this detail geometrically displaced with something like Nanite, which can introduce geometric aliasing or tie your shadow techniques to expensive VSMs or noisy megalites. Because the pre-pass provides the final scene depth, the first half of the second geometry pass only writes static objects saving pixel invocations from randomly writing to a velocity buffer that could be contextually worthless from draw to draw. When it starts drawing objects with a velocity, a render target with only two channels is written into. The next part of the pipeline processes a temporal disocclusion update, as well as integrating the micro detail inside one of the render targets into a depth scene copy. Occlusion culling is done next for about 300 different draws. Next, some decal buffers are written along with some Atlas texture updates. The high Z is processed and then this buffer has information from the current frame's render targets gradually decoded into its various channels. You'll find a lower precision depth scene without the micro detail and some other G buffers. Some noise like textures and dense geometry are processed followed by the production of this texture which contains altered half resolution depth data. Reading the full resolution depth scene with a micro detail impression, screen space shadows are then gradually processed in three draws. Despite the screen space shadow technique being the exact same shader used on Unreal, it's far less dependent on temporal smearing and days gone's unknown configuration. But there are scenarios where it needs alteration for TAA independency. We have too many people who act like fixing smear dependency harms optimized performance. This is a very poor and commonly spread take that this channel is constantly proving against. CryEngine also has a very fast screen space shadows that would resolve much more stable without any anti-aliasing. And even if it was, say, 33% more expensive to resolve independently of TAA, that's where our stated target hardware can easily and should progress in. If you agree with that philosophy, hitting the subscribe button gives industry support for that view. 600 draws are written to the sun's cascaded shadow maps, with each cascade being a squared resolution of 1152 pixels. The shadows are then downscaled to a more advanced encoding to around one tenth of its original size. I haven't looked into the purpose of this texture yet, but it could be used for soft shadows or light cooling. Then sprites containing depth and other information of foliage are rendered on these textures. Now this is super interesting because the pine tree meshes in Silent Hill 2 Remake caused horrible performance problems and further hurt performance when they were drawn directly into the shadow maps. Here in Days Gone, there's a whole other, highly optimized approach for foliage shadow casting. This resource is updated slightly, followed by major changes to these environment textures which represent sky and terrain information, which are most likely used as specular fallback when screen space reflections aren't available. Because Days Gone is a use case game, a mostly static environment with dynamic lights, small scale lighting hints based on static geometry are placed throughout the world. So the GPU during this stage cross-references the dynamic shadow map information to provide local bounce light based on the direct lighting. By toggling Crouch to move this character's shadow on this red car, we can see how reactive this non-screen space bound GI is. It's not updating on a per frame basis. It spaces out some of the update computations across a few frames to save performance without the player noticing too much. The GPU is just using a shadow map information to determine if that local lighting hint near the car is within the sun's direct lighting. Now does this technique provide radiance based lighting or indirect shadows? No. But it only costs 0.6 milliseconds versus Lumen's best case scenario 5 milliseconds in open worlds and it doesn't come with Lumen's temporal smearing issues either. Taking a look at some other scenes in the game, it's more than possible that it's being combined with a variant of DFAO. There's a lot of potential in scaling a system like this. And I bet there's plenty of developers who are stuck with UE5 who'd rather take a system closer to this one that takes a computational advantage of their static environment. 
and then similar to Days Gone's approach, have it combined with maybe Radiant Space as CGI, or sparse ray tracing support for dynamic elements. Something that's in that 2 millisecond range that supports indirect shadows. But no one's funding the research for an approach like this for the common use case game. The next step in the pipeline uses one of the full resolution render targets, depth scene, and half resolution lit buffer of the previous frame to produce the current frame's screen space indirect lighting texture here. It's then spatially denoised and blended with the previous frame's indirect lighting buffer. This is similar to Jedi Survivor's approach to temporal and direct lighting, except done about four times faster with a lot less channel ghosting. But it also fizzles more. This happens when temporal logic is less accumulatory, but it also means that it's less prone to motion smearing. The GPU then evaluates what objects are in direct lighting and where subsurface scattering needs representation. The previously lit buffer is overwritten across multiple draws to complete the direct and indirect lighting, only taking these textures as the input. MIP chains and translucents are processed, followed by the addition of fog. Color grading, UI updates, and motion blur are processed. The UI is added in the same draw that adds TAA to the frame. Here's the estimated millisecond budget for this capture scenario, which is within the median millisecond budget. Now let's start going over the conclusions and related lessons for this title. Number one, I'd reference this game's take on foliage appearance. It feels like too many games get foliage incorrect, and this game is just using a six-year-old subsurface scattering model to achieve its incredible results. Also note how close foliage uses more vertices to fit tighter around the alpha mask, but further foliage uses less vertices for a less precise fit. The more precise cutout prevents pixel overdraw better, and since only so many objects can logically appear closer to the camera, you'll have guaranteed limits of vertex processing. But logically, you're going to have more foliage pushed away from the camera, which can easily multiply the cost of those high vertex representations into a vertex bottleneck that will combine with inherent quad overdraw issues you encounter with distant meshes. This outlines an approach for foliage LODs, and it shows the need for software rasterization, as seen in Nanite, that exclusively runs on quad-unfriendly, distant foliage. Number two, take note on how the warm color grading makes a huge difference in conveying the sun's indirect lighting influence. Number three, Days Gone uses temporal noise in order dithering. With or without TAA, the order dithering pattern has a more subtle fade, but the order dithering in this game is slightly jittered. At a V-Sync 60 FPS, we can easily perceive some flickering because the jitter pattern has more than two consecutive movement positions. If engines keep order dither jitter under two alternating positions, the eyes at 60 Hz will be able to blend the two frames together without needing TAA. Yup, that's right. That means forcing a dependency on 59 frames or higher per second. With the context of knowing our target hardware, visual and performance goals, Forcing a dependency on something that looks and feels good is far better than forcing a dependency on something that looks like crap. Another key observation, it doesn't fade between the full order dithering pattern. Order dithering in Days Gone blends between numerical checkpoints within the order dithering algorithm where noticeable patterns aren't as present. Number four, learn from this game and add a depth of field toggle to your gameplay, since many have a strong dislike for the effect. And do not tie graphics functionality such as the user interface or graphic stability in effects like screen space shadows, SSR, soft cascaded shadows, or SSGI to blurry TA. All these effects can include their own temporal accumulation without destroying performance. Number five, you can now reference the indirect lighting approach in this game. While not perfect, it's clear that approaches can be built upon this with ray tracing or radiance based GI. Speaking of ray tracing, I do think this game runs well enough to support ray trace reflections which could help significantly with specular leaking in this game. Moving to APIs like DirectX 12 or Vulkan can make that easier, and if used properly can provide more performance headroom via async compute support. Number six, don't underestimate how important shadows can be. Unreal is one of the few engines where lights do not support shadow fadeouts as light sources become more distant from the camera. It's only recently that one of our brilliant members of our Threat Interactive Discord drafted a pull request for Unreal source code to support this exact functionality. Shadow casting and light overlap are far bigger performance killers, but Unreal just fades lights away because that's what works for Fortnite. Number seven, you can now reference a stellar example of geometric management, but Days Gone does have low resolution texture issues, and it's probably because it was developed before 9th gen came out. So this is something that new productions and new hardware can easily improve on. There are more areas to discuss the improvements on, but I and thousands of others don't believe the poor performing alternatives being pushed today are the right approaches. I would love to provide shader code and workflow tips for the related graphic approaches such as the depth illusion or unreal material functions that provide the order dithering approach I discussed. I want to see these in other projects, including my own game, but there's not a lot of code resources to share at the moment. 
I analyzed that Need for Speed title because I wanted to showcase the modified screen space reflections because this studio and our X amount of subscribers believes that the way that it looks and performs should be adopted as industry standard. But it's not, and so aren't these geometric workflows. Instead, poor TA is. I'm not sure if this is obvious, but my plan for Threat Interactive is to start dispersing Unreal Material templates and resources that align with the topics we present in videos like this one. We want to bring awareness to developments such as engine patches, which could end up being more economic in terms of project integration than a full-fledged fork, and developments such as the new SMA plugin, which still needs some work but is a good step in the right direction. If you've developed shaders, patches, or Unreal code that relates to fixing the issues we speak about, contact us with your innovations because we might be able to push your important developments out to the industry with our videos. If you enjoyed this video or learned something new, all I ask for is a like and subscribe. The subscriber number has the power to change the entire industry because it helps us reach more people including gamers, developers, and even companies who want to get involved in producing more optimized and better looking games. It represents an ignored market that includes developers who want better performance and visuals without Vaseline-like or noisy image quality. And if you really want to catapult the success of this channel, we need more people to post our videos in giant game subreddits, forums, and huge game-related Discord channels. This pushes our reach by the hundreds of thousands, and a big thank you to those who have done just that. I do see you sharing and it means a lot. If you're new to the channel, watch every single video we've done in order of release to learn the truth about modern optimization. Until then, thank you for watching this one.